So Amanda, thank you for coming on the Medic Cast and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. So I thought we'd start off with uh, introducing you to the audience and giving you an opportunity to introduce yourself, actually. Uh, so tell everybody a little bit about your background and uh, your qualifications. Well, I went to the great University of Florida, go Gators, and I did my undergraduate and graduate work there. I graduated in 2007 cum laude with my doctorate of pharmacy, um, after which I went into retail. So I got some management skills there. I thought I could change the world, but there were a few obstacles there, so I moved into hospital, and there I was introduced to emergency medicine. Now, my husband's already uh, a paramedic and firefighter, so I had a little bit of an introduction, but I've been working for almost five years in an emergency department in Orlando, and it's been a great experience, which led me to create Pharmacology Consulting Services, because our director ended up being the interim director for Lake EMS. And he asked me, hey, there's these protocols, which were probably about 200 pages. Take a quick look and see if you see if anything that's wrong. Well, there were quite a few things that were wrong from the way things were referenced to administration rates, dosing. Um, not enough to cover just quickly, so I gave him the highlights of the most important things. But then I went back and asked is there anyone doing this? Is pharmacy involved in all in emergency medicine? There's studies for the emergency department, which is a more controlled setting, that show it's a dangerous environment because there's less supervision because it's mostly just nurses and doctors, and it's verbal communication, which can lead to errors and patient um, harm. In emergency medicine, I mean, you just have protocols and who's on the scene, and it's the most unstable patient's going to be. They call 911. They respond, they have to assess very quickly and get them transported and take care of them quickly. So if you don't have protocols that are based on the appropriate evidence or administration rate and what have you, you could have a lot of issues that you didn't even know. So I created this to try to get pharmacists involved because if you think about every other part of healthcare, they're there when you pick up your prescription from the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. They're behind the scenes at the hospital double checking what the doctors and ordered and looking at the labs and the administration rate. And now we're even being integrated into programming the computer systems because everyone's going to EMARS and um, CPOE, com Computer Physician Order Entry, to make sure that there's less opportunity to create errors based on medication dosage, um, renal function, and all these complex things that the patients have going on with them. So the fact that I found no pharmacists involved in emergency medicine was concerning to me. So it's a great opportunity for us to improve their care. So it's just a matter of getting it out there. And of course, physicians, I love them and they know a lot. I don't know how to diagnose anybody with anything, but I know about medications. Yep. So it's hard for them to admit there's something that they don't know or that they need me. So it took me at least a year to gain the confidence and trust of my emergency department physicians so I understand it takes a little bit for these EMS directors who've been doing this for probably 10, 15 years, some of them, to say that collaborative practice is now the way that medicine's going because we find everyone has a different perspective, different training. We look at things differently and we can find different ways to improve things together. So um, a lot of hospitals have pharmacists also specialized, just like doctors are specialized. I mean, you have oncologists, emergency medicine, hospitalists. There's an endless supply of specialties, so that's how we have to come together. Because medications, even me, I don't know all the medications all the time. I have to look them up. So it's impossible for one person to know everything. Yeah. But together, I mean, it makes it a lot better for the patient overall. And, and that collaborative change has really been going on in the hospital for, for some time. And for those people, you know, know that I'm also an RN. So, you know, I've seen uh, the, the larger hospitals at least have integrated pharmacists on the floors and specialized units and things like that that are right there for nurses and physicians to to check back on their medications and double check on on, on problems and, and uh you know, comorbid factors and, and other medications the patient may already be taking um, so that we can make sure that there's not any kind of um, um, mix-ups and, and things where pay, um, medications are interacting. But in the field of EMS, we don't have that. And even for the limited number of drugs we give, you said you found medication errors in, in, in just one set of protocols. And, and oh, for the hundreds of protocols around the United States, how many other medication errors and problems are there? 
Absolutely. And it's changing. So if you're not updating them constantly and looking at the new medications that come out, like one of the contraindications to um, nitroglycerin or like Viagra and Cialis, and those are typically known for sexual dysfunction. But now we found through accident, which is the way some things are found, that it's great for pulmonary hypertension. Mm -hmm. And now we have pulmonary hypertension, which probably 10 years ago we didn't know about. So how many of your EMS providers are aware that Vivatio is actually Viagra, just a different brand name and dosage for pulmonary hypertension? So you have to be current on a lot of the new medications and indications and the names and make sure that you're keeping up to date all the, on all these things because you can easily harm a patient just by a lack of knowledge. Right. And, and so you've put together this idea that um, not only do, does EMS need a medical director, but maybe they need a pharmacology director as well. Absolutely. You, um, anytime you have a patient event, a sentinel event, something that goes wrong with the patient, um, everybody's going to look at it differently. In the hospital, they involve pharmacists because we may see something from a pharmacy perspective that the physician might not or the nurse might not uh, that we can identify and then see how we can prevent these type of things from happening in the future, use them as a learning tool. But if we don't recognize it was a medication issue, then how do we know that we can fix it or that we can improve for patients later on? So the, the pharmacist perspective is gaining... Um, it's getting more, uh, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Well, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I mean, it's getting more people, momentum behind it. There is a lot more momentum. We're, we have doctors of pharmacy and we were underutilized for a long time. When I talked to my husband's parents or grandparents, they're like, oh, how many pills do you dispense a day? That's not the role that pharmacy is evolving to. We are more medically involved. We are more clinical. Um, we have a I mean, why go to a pharmacy school with a doctorate when you're just going to be counting pills all day? Our purpose is much greater and we have a lot more knowledge that can be utilized in the system than it is currently. And even the pharmacists at the retail setting, I, I actually was uh, uh, attending a public health conference recently and they talked about the, the tremendous public health resource that is the community pharmacist because they're a trusted member of a patient's healthcare team. The patients really value their input, value their advice, and uh, why shouldn't we be utilizing that resource as well? And that's part of why I think for at least the past 10 years, pharmacists rank in the top five uh, trusted health professionals, and one of it's because of their access. Um, so I know that I, in the retail setting, was able to help a lot of my patients, um, whether it's lower drug costs, drug interactions, by not changing myself but suggesting they go back to their doctor for alternatives. Uh, there's great opportunity there, but they are also, you know, crunched for time, and mm -hmm. it's a lot harder for them nowadays than it was when I was there to provide that type of service unless their employer or um, provider makes that uh, important to them. But with the... Um, brown bag, they called it, where they medications, they, the, the pharmacist will sit there and go through with them. Since now insurances are covering that, it makes it a lot easier for the pharmacist to find time since they're being compensated for that type of in-depth yeah. um, evaluation of a patient. But it is coming around because it's a Medicare required thing that they have that opportunity for patients to go through their medications with the pharmacist to look for issues with their medications. So yeah, we're great resources and finally the medical community is starting to realize this. So what is it that you recommend for an EMS service out there? We have a lot of um, EMS supervisors, uh, chiefs, and, and upper, upper level management that check out the show. We have medical directors that check out the show um, and educators. What is it that you recommend that an EMS system does um, to get started with working with a pharmacist? Because this is a brand new relationship. Like you said, it took you a year to really gain the trust of your ER physicians when you started working with them. Absolutely. I have um, my website, pharmacologyconsultingservices.com. You can check me out. Uh, give me a call. Email me. I'd be happy to talk to you and see what we can do. You can email me your protocols. Um, we can go through some of the things I found on Lake uh, County's protocols to see what I'm doing, where I'm coming from. I have references on the website also. But um, it's all about what's going on with your EMS 
what you have set up, what are their capabilities, where do you want to go. Um, just like in my ER, my my position is very fluid. It all depends on what we need today. What do you need from me? What resources? I think quick references are great. Like that's what Dr. Hand uh, with the hand heavy method came up with. It's because yes. they're not quick references. Because who wants to calculate the medication doses on a five kilogram baby? It's right. hard enough when you're dealing with that situation. You shouldn't have to do the math. So I provided for the nurses not only in the ER but throughout the hospital quick references like on your badges so you flip to it quickly. Mm -hmm. The less complicated you make it, the easier it is to do it, the more comfortable people are with it. So it's about making people comfortable and safe and getting people the medications they need at the doses that are appropriate. So feel free to contact me. I um, may not respond immediately but I will respond very as quick as possible. Yeah, and it, it's important, I think, for people to start thinking in this direction is, as EMS becomes integrated more and more in, in the overall healthcare system, uh, there's going to be even more of an expectation for us to, to be providing some of this oversight of understanding patients' own medications and how they interact with the, the medications we might be giving them. Can you give us, before we go, an example of some of the things you found in, in EMS protocols as you've reviewed them? Uh, that, that really caught your eye and, and you know you talked a little bit about um, watching for, for alternative versions of things like Viagra given for pulmonary hypertension. What other things did you run into? Uh, magnesium was a big issue because if you're doing it like in the hospital setting for just magnesium replacement, you're going to run it very slow, two grams over an hour. But if you're giving it for something like eclampsia or preeclampsia, you're going to get much higher doses much quicker. Um, also, asthma is another indication, but there is a max rate that you're going to actually just cause harm versus any benefit. So in the protocols, they were completely mixed up. For your preeclampsia, you were giving it slow. For your asthma, you were giving it faster than preeclampsia. Um, so those, that in itself, um, which routes, uh, IM versus IV, especially important when you're talking about um, ep epi, epinephrine. Uh, so there's a lot of or slang terms when we have documents that are published that can come back to us you don't put a volume size like bicarb in the field it's uh, referred to as an amp well that's inappropriate when you're talking about right. documentation you have to put the dosage and that's even in the ER they use it all the time give them an amp give them it's really should be a gram or 50 MEQs whatever your dose is it's specific to the medication because especially on the back orders you never know what size you're going to get nowadays right. volumes changing all the time um, and then that's another thing that's affecting EMS greatly is the back orders because there's two groups of medications chronically on back order over the last four years and that's emergency medicines and chemotherapy drugs yeah. so that's another um, aspect that I've helped not only EMS deal with but my ER because there's a lot of medications you have to be able to compensate when you don't have available what you normally would or what's in your protocol. So you right. have to have a plan in place and be proactive, keep an eye out for drug shortages. Some of them, there's a, a pattern to them, so you know approximately when it's going to happen. So keeping inventory, knowing what's going to happen, what's going on um, with the manufacturers, it's, it's a lot more complicated than it was a few years ago. And every year we're seeing new literature published the back orders themselves are worse every year. There's fewer manufacturers, there's more demand, and our population is getting older. So it's not going to get any easier, and we're not going to have any less volume. So we just have to be prepared to get ahead of it. I'm very proactive. I hate being reactive. Yeah. Be proactive, plan, have something in place, get everybody educated so that, especially the bigger the system, the earlier you have to have your plan in place so that everybody knows what's going on and you can be ready to put this into action. Yeah. So that's a big thing in medicine that's hard. It's hard to be proactive when some of it you can't control and you can't plan for. But some of it we do know what's coming up. We can make backup plans and backup plans for our backup plans and get that out there so that we can do what's best for the patients. And you get those replacement suppliers that give you a drug that's in, now in a different concentration and they're, they're, uh, I can imagine a pharmacist would be a tremendous help to get the education material together to send out so that the, the providers in the field say, oh, that's right, I've got a new container, I've got a new 
concentration of this med, which means I'm not drawing up two mils like I was before. I, mm -hmm. I've got to make it, I've got to think completely differently, but it, it requires you to be educated about that. So sending in a sheet or an email or a required training um, session with the supervisors on the shifts when it's been implemented, all of that has to come from a trusted resource. And having a pharmacist as part of your team makes that information that much more reliable. Absolutely, yeah, and that's that's a big part. We're a big uh, component for prevention of errors, and then if they do happen, how can we prevent them? Um, people I work with think I'm a little uptight when it comes to medications, but that's what I deal with. That's yeah. where my concern is. So they, some people, they work with them all the time. They become too comfortable. They don't pay attention, but it's the minor differences. Um, pharmacists are known for their attention to all the minutia. Uh, but that's how we're trained. That's why we're good pharmacists it's because we pay attention to all the little detail and we can relay it in a way that everyone will understand because I do patient education, doctors, nurses, and EMS. They're all different levels. So you have to be able to understand it well enough to communicate it to everyone and know what's important for people to know because I'm not going to waste your time telling you something you don't need to know. But if I'm telling you then it's important. It's important that you recognize it and then keep that in mind and keep it available so that when you need it, you have that information. Well, Amanda, why don't you give us your website one more time? It's pharmacologyconsultingservices.com. I know it's quite long. I couldn't find anything shorter, but uh, the link will be posted. That's probably the easiest way. You can put it in your favorites. If you want to email me, it's pharmacologyconsultingservice at gmail.com. And then phone number 352-256-4242. And feel free to text me a call. Um, if I don't answer, I will call you back as soon as possible. Excellent. And, you know, hopefully, Amanda, we're going to have you on maybe as a semi-regular segment here, maybe once a month or once every couple of months to talk about specific EMS medication issues that um, will help educate people about the value of having a pharmacist on their team. And, and I'm excited that we're going to have a pharmacist on our team here at the MedicCast. I'm excited to be here and I look forward to future conversations.